Okay, before coming to the Indian monsoon from Africa, we will jump to the East Asian monsoon, which has uh, obviously been a center for uh, evolution of uh, homo lineages, uh, especially uh, uh, before Europe saw some of the anatomically modern humans and so on. And monsoon climate, of course, is a big part of this uh, region. And in the context of Holocene, you want to see how uh, societies, agriculture, and even empires probably got affected by uh, the changes in the monsoon. And like the Indian monsoon, East Asian monsoon also has a summer monsoon and a winter monsoon. Summer monsoons get most of the attention because they tend to cover uh, upwards of 80% of the annual rainfall, but uh, in India, for example, the northeast monsoon covers only a small part of the country, and most of the uh, attention during the Holocene has focused on the uh, summer monsoon regions like the Mohenjo-daro Harappa, which we will uh, look at. So, just schematically, this is the northern hemisphere summer and northern hemisphere winter, and you can see there is the jet stream which moves quite uh, significantly in latitude from summer to winter. Uh, so summer monsoon circulation tends to uh, push the uh, westerlies uh, way further north and then during the uh, winter that can dip down quite significantly south. And then you have other troughs like the sum, uh, summer monsoon limit here with East Asian monsoon circulation which interacts with the Indian monsoon circulation which we will look at later. So the moisture sources here are obviously complicated as uh, we will see here. But first, the Northern Hemisphere winter then uh, uh, is related to the Siberian uh, Eurasian high pressure that begins to push uh, the winds uh, uh, from the northwest, whereas in India it's mostly the northeasterly winds during the winter monsoon. And you can see now the winter monsoon limit is way over down here into the northwestern Pacific and uh, shields uh, part of the, the Asia down here, Southeast Asia down here. And in terms of summer moisture sources, you can see the relative numbers here. Uh, majority of it comes from <coughs> the Indian Ocean and South China Sea region, uh, which you can infer from the circulation here. And uh, a f point 0.2 comes from uh, the Pacific, uh, point 0.4 here uh, from the uh, other sources that uh, are overlapping with the Indian source and uh, drops down to 0.2 to 0.1 here and 0.1 in terms of the Pacific source. So the Pacific source is large uh, relatively here and then drops off quickly because it's consistent with the uh, circulation. There are other dynamics involved here uh, with the West North Pacific uh, anticyclone and the subtropical high and so on. You can see part of it here which begin to steer the winds as well. So monsoon dynamics just like the West Pacific uh, uh, sorry, just like the African monsoon are complicated with local uh, factors and remote forcings from uh, the El Nino and Pacific Decadal Oscillation and so on. One key aspect of the uh, uh, monsoons over East Asia is that the uh, winter and summer monsoons kind of got disconnected at some point. So you can see we are going through uh, in terms of summer insulation uh, again late uh, Holocene, mid Holocene to early Holocene. Uh, this is the summer insulation at 30 north. Uh, so you can see and note the scale here is reversed so be careful with that. Uh, and you can see various evidences from uh, various lakes and lusts and uh, caves and so on and uh, ocean sediments are combined. Uh, so you can see there is a, quite a bit of scatter in the different data. So you can see here the time scales going back from about uh, 10,000 years to the present. So we had uh, high insulation coming out of the uh, 
uh, last glacial maximum leading to uh, warm wet uh, times, uh, Holocene optimum, and then the drying uh, as the radiation has dropped off uh, into the present. Um, and the EASM obviously extracts time scales out of it, uh, resolved uh, poorly in terms of uh, uh, resolution in time, of course. Uh, so you can see that there have been, uh, you can see here the uh, EASM strength. Uh, weaker starting out uh, during the so-called uh, Holocene climatic optimum. It was warm and wet, then dipped off where we saw several uh, civilizations being affected, got wet again, and then during the little ice age it dropped off and then we are here. Uh, we are not quite getting to the global warming period yet here. And if you look at the uh, East Asian winter monsoon, you can see that in this region there is hardly any correlation. So if we are looking for a correlation between ESM and uh, EAWM, uh, the correlations are weak in the recent times, but in the past, when we came out of the last glacial maximum, uh, it was going up and down, but still it remained fairly strong in terms of the winter and summer circulations. And at some point when the drying happened, uh, let's say around the 4200 event, uh, the correlation weakened substantially and has oscillated around a much lower value uh, here. So this is something that has to be kept in mind. So one long-standing issue in the paleoclimate records is whether East Asian summer monsoon peaked early in the uh, peaked in the early Holocene or mid Holocene. So the question is, uh, where did it peak? Is it did it peak here or here? Uh, not all uh, evidences agree. Cave Typically, stalagmites, stalactites tend to differ from ocean sediments, for example, and it could be related to the way winds are, are related to the strengthening or weakening of the monsoon and where the ocean productivity goes up and ocean sediments indicate stronger winds, but on the other side of the jet axis, for example, uh, it could actually be reduced production uh, and impacts on cave stalagmites versus uh, the monsoon. So it's a very complicated issue and there are many good papers looking at these differences between uh, paleo evidences. This paper offers a new view on this. Um, here combining a set of transient earth system model simulations with proxy records, we propose that over northern China monsoon rainfall peaked in the early Holocene while soil moisture and tree cover peaked in the mid Holocene. So if you look at pollen evidences versus uh, caves you may or lakes and ocean you may find that the interpretation of the uh, soil moisture and tree cover may be confused with the uh, monsoon peaks. The delayed ecosystem, so soil moisture and tree cover response to fall, rainfall is caused by the vegetation response to winter warming and the subsequent feedback with soil moisture. So this relates to how uh, winter monsoon and summer monsoon was correlated early on and then they got decoupled for example. So circulation is a big part of the monsoonal moisture sources and rainfall always. Our study provides a mechanism for reconciling different evolution behaviors of monsoon proxy records. It sheds light on the driving mechanisms of the monsoon evolution and monsoon ecosystem feedback over northern China with implications to climate changes in other high climate sensitivity regions over the globe. Obviously uh, tree cover and uh, especially soil moisture would have affected agriculture as well and also foraging and other societal resilience factors uh, during these uh, rainfall changes and ecosystem responses. So how those translated into various uh, responses in human communities of the time is not very easy to infer. So this then looks at the uh, uh, trace 21 simulations with uh, various proxy evidences. I won't read all the details here, but basically they do uh, sensitivity studies. Uh, this is the uh, 
current climatology. So there is the Dali Lake and the various uh, pollen and uh, paleosol sites. So soil moisture, soil data and pollen data. Uh, and these are the relative changes uh, in the region that is marked here. Uh, so relative change of soil moisture, you can see how it varies uh, for from the model simulation uh, for the current period in terms of gradations uh, of rainfall and then that has to be interpreted in terms of the paleo evidences. So this is looking at simulated East, uh, East Asian uh, summer monsoon in meters per second and uh, simulated Delta O18, which can be indicator of uh, model's ability to reconstruct past climates. So precipitation is not directly measured, but you have to confirm that the model is doing well with some other proxy like Delta O18, and then compare to uh, the rainfall from the model. So you can see that the model does pretty well. Now we have flipped the axis going from the last glacier, the beginning of the Holocene to the present. So summer monsoon has dropped with ups and downs, uh, with some early Holocene, mid Holocene, late Holocene demarcations here in terms of threshold. So even though rainfall may look like it's dropping continuously, it may induce, th induce threshold behavior in terms of vegetation response, soil moisture response, agricultural productivity, and societal responses, for example. This is simulated northern China rainfall again uh, compared to Dali Lake level uh, reconstructed from paleo data. Again, model uh, can be uh, argued to do uh, fairly well. This is the pollen-based rainfall which differs from the model reconstruction and other proxies. So if you look at temperatures, uh, temperate trees uh, in terms of the distributions and simulated temperature uh, tree, you can see they kind of agree that the rainfall peak and the ecosystem response are not coincident. So there is a delayed response, which is somewhat known at seasonal time scales. For example, trees can take up a lot of water when it's raining in a monsoon regime. Monsoons have active and break periods, so it rains for a while and then it uh, stops or becomes very less like it's happening now. It rained almost a meter or more in two weeks and last two days it has been fairly quiet, even sunny yesterday. So trees that take up water during that time release moist water vapor through evapotranspiration during the break periods and it is shown that some other region will benefit from this released water vapor and they get rain while this region is in a break period for example okay so that's something to keep in mind and this is just stable dune percentage and simulated soil moisture again the point is that rainfall and soil moisture have to be compared carefully uh, soil moisture peak happens here and rainfall is uh, basically decreasing during that time. So that's the vegetation feedback and of course if you have a model you can do sensitivity studies and they do, did sensitivity studies with all forcing, with orbit, orbital forcings, with greenhouse gases. Uh, this is the uh, 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 Monsoon, uh, doo -doo -doo, I should look it up. This is the ice forcing and the total of all uh, forcing. Okay, so insulation, various and relative sea level here, and CO2 forcing. And looking at EASM, the main point made in the model, in the uh, study, in this paper is that vegetation feedbacks actually produced a delayed soil moisture and pollen record with respect to rainfall uh, so that interpreting the peak of the rainfall based on different evidences that record rainfall versus uh, vegetation response and soil moisture response have to be done uh, carefully. Okay, uh, did I miss something? Okay, let's uh, leave this here and then come back to Indian monsoon in the next podcast. Let me fi uh, make sure I said what is MWF properly before I uh, quit this podcast. Yes, unfortunately when I prepare these things I'm uh, not 
carefully noting all the uh, acronyms and then I screw up. It turns out that MWF is meltwater flux, which is actually an important component of the forcing because through the Holocene you have had uh, glacial melts which created the 8200 event as well as the uh, Black Sea Noah's Flood which I think we already talked about in the previous podcast. So that uh, does affect the meridional overturning circulation and the global uh, energy balance as well as location of the ITCZ which affects the monsoons and so on. So all forcings together, uh, orbital forcings which are like insulations here, uh, relative sea level comes from ice forcing, greenhouse gases is CO2, they may have also other uh, gases estimated like methane and N2O, you can check that. Melt water forcing is put on the uh, North Atlantic to see how meridional overturning circulation is perturbed and you can see all those impacts listed here. I won't go into the details but you can see that Northern China rainfall responds to these forcings uh, with either increases or decreases and the net result uh, and especially the soil moisture is a combination of all these factors uh, which is what the models are uh, good for. Okay, uh, Sorry about uh, that. Uh, hopefully that clarifies uh, why MWF is included as a sensitivity parameter.